welcome everybody uh, to the Fleet Center and I hope that you uh, get something out of my talk today. That's my goal as a professor is always to have people learn something. And so um, as the title of my talk says is what is in the air we breathe. So before we get started, let's all take a deep breath. <sighs> Okay, let's, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as I go along. So um, let, let's, let's think about what's in the air. So if you think about what's in the air, we have gases uh, such as oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. Um, we have lower levels of other gases such as ozone. Uh, there are a lot of different types of organic compounds in the air, so lots of different gases. You're probably most familiar with oxygen and nitrogen, which makes up uh, most of the air that we breathe. Um, and so here's uh, just a picture of some uh, different uh, air scenarios, if you will, um, near a volcano, um, maybe uh, off of the five, um, another picture of an industrial power plant, and then a picture of a dust storm, and I'll talk more about that. And what, what you should notice about these pictures is that there's uh, something besides the gases that are in the air, there's something called uh, aerosols. And so a a lot of the focus of my talk today will be on these aerosols. So let's think about aerosols for a moment. Uh, maybe some of you uh, are used to aerosols from spray cans, so you just push the button on the top, you get a spray, and so you're forming an aerosol. So that's one type of aerosol, but there are many other types of aerosols that I want to tell you about today. But um, being a, an academic, I just want to sort of define what I mean by an aerosol. And so aerosols are solid or any solid or liquid part particles suspended in air with diameters between 0.002 micrometers, a micrometer is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters, so it's small, to about 100 micrometers. So that's a pretty wide size range. Um, aerosols are also known sometimes as particulate matter in air, or you'll hear aerosol particles, so I just wanted to also introduce those different terms. So there's this big size range, five or orders of magnitude, where an order of magnitude is a factor of 10, and that's because there's differences in their formation mechanisms, differences in their composition across this large size range. So going back to those pictures I showed you a moment ago, uh, we were looking at these at first from our eyes, the volcanic uh, uh, eruption, the, the cars. But what we do in my group is we zoom in on the aerosols. And so we zoom in using techniques like electron microscopy. And what you can see is part of that big puffy plume from the volcano. You see these individual volcanic ash particles or if I zoomed into some of the um, emissions from cars or buses, I might see these smaller particles agglomerated together, these soot particles. Or perhaps if I zoom in on those emissions from an industrial power plant, I see these more spherically shaped particles that we sometimes we call them fly ash. Or maybe I'm looking at this dust storm. We could be in Phoenix, we could be in China, we could be anywhere in the world. These types of things happen, and what you can see is these different, uh, what we call mineral dust aerosol particles. So really aerosols come from a lot of different sources, and so they have different shapes, they have different sizes. Other sources of aerosol particles include just biologicals, right? So spores, um, even uh, viruses, these are all sort of aerosols in the air when they are floating around in the air, bacteria, so that's another source of aerosols. When we think about aerosol size, what does she mean by a micrometer? Well, if you think about a human hair, that's between about 50 or 70 microns or micrometers, you know, again, 10 to the minus 6 meter. I have kind of coarse hair, hairs. Mine might be 100 micrometers. If you have fine hair, maybe it's on the order of 20 or 10 micrometers. And that's the, what we're talking about is the diameter. Beach sand, about, you know, many, many, many of you maybe want to go to the beach. That's about 90 micrometers. 
micrometers via very fine beach sand. But when we talk about particulate matter, when we talk about things like dust and pollen and mold as shown over here, uh, they tend to be less than 10 micrometers. Some of the things that I was talking about earlier, uh, these combustion particles, they're even smaller on the order of 2.5 micrometers or below. They get really, really small. And so we have this very large size distribution. So let's talk about aerosols some more. Let's learn a little bit uh, more about uh, aerosols and, and how they impact us um, in many, many different ways. So there's uh, two sources, uh, major sources of atmospheric aerosols, uh, mineral dust and sea spray. Mineral dust is that dust storm I was showing you a moment ago. So here is the Earth. This brown cloud is a simulation of dust storms, maybe from uh, Africa uh, showing over here. So there's like a dust belt that we have a dust belt in the world because we have these uh, large desert regions, the Saharan Desert, the Gobi Desert um, form that uh, big dust belt. And then we have this out here, something we're very familiar with in San Diego, the oceans, right? 71% uh, of the Earth's surface is covered with oceans and a lot of aerosols come from the ocean. So that's something that my group is very interested in at the University of California, San Diego, is this mineral dust and sea spray that comes from the ocean in the form of these aerosols. So let me teach you a little bit about, or let's learn a little bit more about some of these. Um, so mineral dust aerosol, here I'm showing two uh, remote uh, satellite uh, images. If we look over here, um, what I'm showing you, this is, this is Africa over here. And this is a dust plume uh, from the Saharan Desert, and it's making its way all the way to Barbados, and then Puerto Rico, and then the Florida Keys. So it makes it all the way here to, to the US. If you look at this image over here, this satellite image, and you can look at these all you want if you get on the NASA website. There are many, many images. Um, what you see is this brown streak here. We see clouds over here, but we see this brown streak here. Uh, this is a Asia over here, so there's a dust storm in China, and then we get this plume of dust that makes its way all the way to the western United States where there could be a poor visibility day um, because there was a dust storm in Asia seven to ten days ago approximately. So, so that just points to the fact that mineral dust as well as other atmospheric aerosols like to travel long distance, hitching a ride around the world. So uh, what we like to say is what happens in Asia doesn't stay in Asia. But similarly, what happens in the US doesn't stay in the US also. So uh, my European friends remind me of that. <laughs> So uh, what does that look like? So on day one, you'll have a dust storm in the Gobi Desert. Uh, this happens every March at least, but other times as well. Um, you'll, see, you'll hear news of that dust storm because it, gets, it makes its way over more uh, populated areas. Uh, there might be pictures on the CNN website showing children putting black plastic bags around their head trying to go to school so they don't breathe in the dust. It's so much dust in the air um, and you know that doesn't that doesn't look good when they have plastic bags around their head I thought we taught them not to do things like that uh, then the dust continues on gets into the some of it some of it comes out of the atmosphere through wet or dry deposition but a lot continues on over the Pacific Ocean making its way to the western United States sometime later so again a truly global world in, in which we, we live and so this mineral dust um, is something my group has been studying a lot. Um, it's chemistry. I think we started this work in like 1998. What's that, over 20 years ago? And um, I actually uh, received an award from the American Chemical Society in 2012. Actually, um, I got the award here in San Diego at the Convention Center. And, and, and the award was for my original and creative contributions in understanding mineral dust aerosol properties 
through laboratory studies, so doing things in my laboratory, which is now here at UC San Diego, and understanding their impact on atmospheric chemistry and climate. And if you want to, you can Google my name, you can you know, go into YouTube and you can look at this video. I won't play it, play it now. But my point here of showing this is that mineral dust, which is a naturally occurring aerosol, uh, is quite abundant here in the uh, Earth's atmosphere. The troposphere is where we are closest to the Earth. To the Earth's surface, and these particles can impact atmospheric chemistry, and it can impact climate. So how do aerosols impact the Earth's climate? So they're out there in the atmosphere, and now uh, they affect atmospheric chemistry, but they also affect climate. So uh, when we think about how aerosols uh, affect climate, we think about it in, in a couple of ways. The first way we think about it is that these aerosol particles can interact. So here are these different particles drawn in cartoon style now. So here's the sun, the big sun, lots of solar radiation coming down. And these particles can scatter light back into space so it doesn't make its way to the Earth's surface. So that's kind of a cooling effect, right? So these particles can scatter light back into space. Another thing that aerosols can do is they can nucleate clouds. So uh, there was a paper in Science um, quite a few years ago about African dust in Florida clouds. So when they went in and zoomed in and tried to collect the, the cloud water, they can detect Saharan dust particles in those clouds because these particles can nucleate, that is make, make forming a cloud. And the cloud, what it does, there's cloud cover and again, the sunlight comes in and it can scatter off. So that's another way to cool the planet, right? In a way, right? That's cooling. In fact, some people think the temperature of the Earth would be much be much higher if we didn't have atmospheric aerosols present. So uh, one can think about, we're here we're talking about sort of ethics and, 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 and that sort of thing, is we can think about can uh, solar geoengineering be used to cool a warming planet? Uh, we're over 400 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere. It doesn't look like we're making any progress in decreasing that amount of CO2, uh, which is causing um, global warming. So another way to write this question is, can aerosols be ejected into the upper atmosphere to scatter sunlight uh, back into space and reduce the temperature of the Earth? So that's, the, that's, a, that's a question people are asking. So there was an article recently in, a, in, a, in a, a magazine you probably don't read. Does anybody read chemical and engineering news here besides me? <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Okay, then maybe you've seen this article. Uh, this article uh, was entitled, Will the World Ever Be Redder, Ready for Solar Geoengineering? And in fact, the article was all about a small-scale sol solar geoengineering project, which was proposed by Harvard University scientist, Harvard University chemist. Uh, what they wanted to do was release a plume of aerosols into the upper atmosphere, and they really wanted to study what would happen to those aerosols when they, when they introduced them. They wanted to do sort of a pre-experiment, right? And so here they were going to have a balloon, they have a recovery parachute, not sure exactly what that's for, but I guess to get their balloon back, and they were going to eject the aerosols into the, into the uh, atmosphere. And so um, one of the uh, people in charge of this experiment, uh, a guy by the name of Frank Koish, who I know, and I, I talked to him about this article uh, last summer, um, he had said in this, in this uh, write-up that he goes, I actually think this is a very terrifying concept, this whole idea of solar geoengineering. But it's really how, what he, how he said it was in the context of, but at the same time, if you look at predictions of climate change, I think they are also very frightening. So he's trying to do, trying to figure out how he can do these small scale experiments to potentially learn something if we ever needed to go that route. So aerosols impact our climate and they might be, it might be something we want to think about or not, right? We might want to think about it or not. And there are a lot of reasons not to think about it that I'll talk about in the Q&A uh, time that we have together. 
Okay, so what other types of aerosols might be interesting to this audience of people living here in San Diego? Well, sea spray aerosol from, you know, wave action and bubble bursting. And what I like to say about sea spray aerosol is that this is where atmospheric chemistry meets marine biology. And so um, if we think about uh, things a lot, uh, it used to be in the old days, people would just think that there was salts in the water and it's sodium chloride and let me breathe that great air of sodium chloride and water and feel really good about myself. But there's this, this what I say is there's salt and many other components that get out of the water into sea spray aerosol. There's all the biology, and I'm not talking about the fish splashing out. I'm talking about the viruses, the bacteria, the phytoplankton. They're all present in sea spray aerosol. And so um, we study this um, at UC San Diego. I'm part of a big center, the Center for Aerosol Impacts on Chemistry of the Environment. I'm the co-director. Um, Kim Prather is the director. We work together. It's funded by the National Science Foundation. It's actually a $20 million center. Uh, we just received our renewal funding recently, and we have a lot of experiments we want to, un we want to do to understand more about this important component of the Earth's atmosphere. Fear. Our mission statement is to transform our ability to accurately predict the impact of aerosols on climate and our environment by bringing the full real world com chemical complexity of the ocean atmosphere into the laboratory. That's hard. Okay, you need $20 million to do that, okay? That's hard. So we want to replicate the, in, a, in a controlled way the ocean atmosphere. So how do you do that? Well, you can only do that at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, right, really. And what I mean by that is that at Scripps, uh, they have the hydraulics lab and they have this ocean atmosphere facility. This is a, 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 a approximately a football field long wave flume. We have Pacific Ocean water here in that flume. This is me over here. I was working with one of my postdocs at the time. These are all these instruments, other students over here. I I know it's hard to see. What we did was, this is our ocean, right? It's the Pacific Ocean water. And then we put a lid on the ocean. And then we purge that above that ocean, the air, to make it particle free and just so we can then break waves like one over here and study that nascent, what we call nascent sea spray aerosol. And we can really capture what's going on. So we did a couple, we, we did an experiment actually in 2014. We're gearing up to do an experiment in 2019 that I can tell you about a little bit later as well. But let me tell you uh, about the 2014 experiment and what we did. Um, what we did in the 2014 experiment was we wanted to look at sea spray aerosol over the course of a phytoplankton bloom. So as the water is changing, and that's we're measuring that here, day zero, day one, day two, day, day, day two, yeah. and then day 10, and we basically see biology kind of growing in is what I would say. So we're starting to form that phytoplankton bloom. In fact, we made the largest indoor phytoplankton bloom ever. And too bad that's not in the Guinness Book of World Records. Because we would have been there. We would have. I, honestly, we would have. It was, it was really the, the largest one ever. Other people have made some in a fish tank, if you will, and, and studied it that way. But this was in a, this very large uh, system. And then what we did was, as the biology and chemistry were going on, so we have bacteria, we have phytoplankton, we sat up here and we were collecting all the sea spray aerosol and were able to say, what was going on in terms of viruses getting out of the water for the first time, bacteria getting out of the water for the first time, different compounds getting out of the water for the first time, and really map that out in a way that no one ever mapped out before. And so uh, that was a really uh, amazing experiment. And uh, we got a lot of press. I did Science Friday interviews a couple of times. If you're interested in hearing more about this experiment, um, that's something that uh, I had the opportunity to do and really uh, explain to a more general audience some of the things that uh, was going on here, at, uh, here in San Diego. 
But the next thing you might want to think about, if, and I hope some thoughts are coming to your, your mind uh, when I talk about what, what comes out of the water and gets into the air is, what happens when water becomes contaminated? We have that problem here, right? Uh, Imperial Beach, uh, signs go up along the coast, do not swim in the water. Okay, so I can follow that directive. I won't go in the water. I'm not going near the water, right? I don't want to have that contaminant touching my skin. I'm not going in the water. But when I see that going on, I want to say, don't breathe the air, okay? That's a lot different directive. That's a lot harder to follow, okay? And so we need to better understand what happens when water becomes contaminated and what is getting into the air. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know? I don't even know, but we need to know, right? And so that's something that people are working on. My colleague Kim Prather has been doing some experiments in Imperial Beach and other people at UC San Diego are starting to look at that. We want to know what happens when water becomes contaminated along our coast and what gets into the air because we are interested in these health effects of aerosols. So what about the health effects of aerosols? What, what do we know? What should we be thinking about? What's the new science that we need to, uh, to, you need to know as the public? What do you need to know? Well, you know, a long time ago, and this article is from 1993, um, journal, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, an association between air pollution and mortality in six U U.S. cities. But we know even before that, in the 70s and the 60s, it was coming out that air pollution and aerosols were a, a problem and ozone levels were a problem and, 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 and LA did a good job of cleaning itself up, if you will, um, because of regulations that work. And so uh, we've known for a long time that aerosols and pollution affect uh, people and their health. Um, a lot has focused on understanding respirable particles, so uh, you know diseases related to the lung, um, and uh, you know we know that smaller particles get deeper into the lung, so having those around is more problematic than maybe some of the larger particles. And so there's a lot of studies that have been done, and for a long time we've known that particulate matter or atmospheric aerosols, aerosols in general, can impact people's health. And so um, that's something uh, we've known. But we've learned a few more things recently. So not only do we know that the pulmonary system is affected, but also the cardiovascular system is affected. So for about 15 years, we've known that heart disease is also impacted by atmospheric aerosols and particulate matter in air, and that's a problem. But the really new thing now is that there is some studies suggesting that atmospheric aerosols, particulate matter in air, can affect the brain. So let me tell you about a little bit about those studies. And there, there aren't many, but there are a few. So there's a study that came out, and this is the study up here, but it, it got picked up by Science uh, Magazine um, in 2017. But basically it was about particulate air pollutants, and it was basically saying there was a contribution uh, for uh, impairment or dementia, cognitive impairment, in older women. And so this was the first study that suggested that in fact um, brain health was uh, being affected by particulate matter. So we knew about the lung, we then knew about the heart, and now we're talking about the brain. And so this article came out, The Polluted Brain, and the question that people are asking now is, what's going on? Are people breathing in particulate matter through the uh, olfactory bulb, through your nose? Is it passing through the smaller particles, the blood-brain barrier? Or are you inhaling these particles? They're going deep in the lung. You're forming cytokines. That's the response of the body to that breathing of particulate matter. And then those are going to the brain. We don't know. Okay, but you know, this makes us all pause and think about you know, what is going on with um, this in the brain. And so I think that there's gonna be a lot more research in that area. 
So um, I am actually coupling uh, with uh, some people in engineering where we're using tissue engineering approaches. I have a collaborator, Xiao Chen Chen, who's able to make three-dimensional models of the brain, heart, and lung uh, using these 3D bioprinting methods. And we're starting to see if we can say something about the interaction between these particles and, and the brain, these particles in heart, these particles in lung, in the lung. So that's something that's new that I wanted to bring to your attention today. Um, in my last few minutes of my talk, I want to now switch from outdoors, which we were thinking about more, to indoors, where we are today, indoors, where you spend 90% of your time. So people in industrialized nations spend 90% of their time indoors. And I will tell you, we know much less about the indoor air chemistry, indoor air quality. We know much less. We know from um, countries, underdeveloped countries, that um, that smoking, or excuse me, cooking stoves and the smoke from cooking stoves causes major health effects and in fact is a major cause of death in a lot of places, in a lot of rural regions where people are just using open fires in their homes to cook their meals. This is causing a lot of lung cancer, it's causing a lot of deaths, it's causing uh, a major uh, health problem and that was recognized many years ago. So 2011 and this, this paper came from. So, but, but what about, you know, when you're not doing that? When you're just here, here we are, indoors, in Neuromaya Flask, and we, if you're in a really, um, uh, the built environment where you don't really open the windows much or anything, we can cork that, and here we are, and we have all these particulate matters from indoors, these gases, here we are. If you open the window, you might have a little bit of an exchange, but we really know very little about the indoor environment. And we're just starting to do experiments on this. And so uh, I'll give you some uh, teasers here um, in terms of indoor chemistry. Here are some new papers coming out. This is 2015, but there's others as well. Human, humans are big emitters. <laughs> and the paper is that siloxanes, these compounds right here, which we use in our shampoo and personal care products, our lotions, I love to shampoo, lotion up. They're made of these uh, siloxanes. Uh, they're called cyclic volatile methyl siloxanes. Um, and then you come here, maybe you washed your hair before you showed up. I feel bad for the person next to you because you're just emitting all this stuff. If I put on my, go my molecular goggles, I'd see all this rings around everybody, these emissions. And so the title of this paper is Siloxanes are the most most abundant volatile organic compound emitted from engineering students in a classroom. And I tell my chemistry students it's not just the engineers. <laughs> It's everyone else as well. And so we're just starting to learn about these gases and these aerosols indoors and trying to understand how it impacts our health. And did I already mention we're 90% of our time indoors and we know much less about the indoor environment. And one of the reasons why is that um, unlike atmospheric chemistry, um, which is outdoors and there's funding agencies like the National Science Foundation that gives money to study that, we don't have that quite indoors. We have NIOSH, the National Institute of, Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, a little bit from EPA, but look at this, little bit from EPA, little, little, little bit from EPA, but nobody is really there doing that. The reason why these studies are going forward is that the Sloan Foundation has decided to run a 10-year program on indoor air chemistry, and so we're starting to learn a lot from that. And hopefully someone else will pick this up afterwards because we really need to know what's in the air we breathe. And so um, I'll end here by just uh, kind of going around some of the different things I talked about today. There's a lot, right? There's a lot of stuff going on. People say, why do you study atmospheric aerosols? Is there anything else to study? I mean, it affects everything. And so um, in the air we breathe outside, there's gases, the aerosols. I showed you some of those when we zoomed in beyond spray cans. 
These aerosols impact climate by scattering solar radiation, nucleating clouds. Uh, well, maybe we should use these for solar geoengineering purposes and really help our planet um, from uh, going to higher temperatures. Um, but by the way, not only can you, do they impact climate, they impact our health in ways we're just starting to figure out. Not just the heart, not just the lung, but the brain. And then, by the way, we're usually indoors, so what's going on there? Are there aerosols inside? Yes. Are they different from outside? Yes. Do we know any much about that, them? Do we know what's going on there? Not really, okay? That's my bad news, not really. But we're, we're now starting to develop an understanding. So uh, I'll end there, and I will thank everybody for coming out tonight to hear a little bit more about what's in the air we breathe and Take a deep breath and uh, let's have the Q&A session in a few minutes. Thank you. So one thing that occurred to me when you were talking was just you said something about your molecular goggles. You know, if I was putting on my molecular goggles and looking at my students, they'd all be emitting these volatile compounds, you know, from their heads, from their recently shampooed heads. Um, and I was wondering, do you think that you do actually see the world a different way just because you deal with these things that are too small for the naked eye to see, but you have such an intimate um, understanding and knowledge of this stuff that is just invisible to the rest of us? Do you think you see the world differently? Thanks for that question. I, I do. I think um, when you study chemistry as long as I have, and it's a molecular science, so it's really um, thinking about things on dimensions that most people don't think. And so um, oftentimes I'll look at something a little bit differently and, and, and think about it from that perspective. Um, and I'm married to a chemist also. And so we'll, we'll, we have, we'll look at each other and we'll think, are you thinking about that in a molecular way? You know, <laughs> we have that commonality. We met at Berkeley uh, and that happens to a lot of people <laughs> at Berkeley. But anyway, yeah, so I do think about things in a very different way. Um, I think about, I'll see a plume. I'll think about the details of the particles in that plume. I'll think about how, where it's moving. I'll think about what gases it will react with in the atmosphere and so no this is not what most people think about wow um, amazing and um, on the way here you actually told me that you're a first generation college student or you were a first generation college student um, can you just tell us a little bit about how you came to be a distinguished professor of chemistry it's a male dominated field um, and just to give us a little sketch of your career thank you for that question so um, I am a first-generation college student, and when I talk to other first-generation college students, the ones that are at UC San Diego now, what I say to them is, you know what that means, being a first-generation college student. You have to figure it out for yourself. You know, sometimes you don't have uh, parents who can necessarily guide you. They can be very supportive, but they, they can't necessarily guide you. So for me, that meant, you know, just uh, less college choices, if you will. Um, but I went to college, and I wanted to, I, I didn't have a good imagination about what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a doctor, right, you know, an MD. Uh, not that that's a bad field, but um, I was just like, I'll do that. I like, I like science. But then I took chemistry. And it really captured my attention. I thought it was a field where you can learn concepts um, that you can apply to so many areas, the environment, to medicine, uh, to many different things. And so that really what captured my attention. Um, I, being a first generation person uh, on the path to being a distinguished professor, um, it's not a straight path. It's a very crooked path, a very jagged path, a little back and forth type path. And so um, that's what I, I tell students too. You would expect someone like myself, you know, to have gone to Caltech undergrad. You then go to UC Berkeley grad. You do a postdoc at Harvard and boom, 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 you're a distinguished professor at UC San Diego. Well, I 
didn't do it exactly that way. I uh, went to one college for a year, then another one for three years, got my bachelor's degree, then I got my master's degree someplace else, and then I went to Berkeley to get my PhD. I did one postdoc, did another postdoc, so really just boom, boom, you know, always jagged all along the way, but at least forward moving, you know, always <laughs> <laughs> moving the whole thing forward, all right? And um, what drove me to continue on was always just I wanted to know more. It did, I didn't want to be a distinguished professor. Um, I just I just wanted to learn more, and so it was. And and that was a that's a great motivating factor, and it's also um, a good reason to continue on. So and I'm I'm still see I'm not done. I still want to know a lot more. Yeah, your sense of just driving curiosity is really apparent. It's so wonderful. Um, so on a more uh, sort of global level, um, you talked a little bit about geoengineering. So here we are at um, this ethics series, and so I just wanted to go straight for the maybe the biggest and most vexed question that might come out of your work. Um, and you said that uh, one of the scientists who was involved in that paper that you mentioned called it a terrifying concept. Um, I remember the first time that I heard about this as a possible um, way of mitigating global warming, I did find it really terrifying. For some reason, hearing about your work and the work of your colleagues um, in chemistry on these aerosols have somehow made it a little friendlier to me for some reason. Um, so how terrifying is it to you, Vicky? And, um, and what do you think about it as, as a possible solution going forward or a possible strategy? So um, I'll tell you what I worry about with that strategy. Um, well, how many people are comfortable with that strategy? I'll ask the audience first. Yeah. You're comfortable with that? Not Moving too many. forward, a couple yeah. of people are. Um, what I worry about the most is that we don't understand all the feedbacks. The Earth system is very complex. And sometimes there are feedbacks that you can't think about. Um, and I worry that we can't fully think through the complexity of the problem. So I presented it to you as we'll just get a balloon, we'll throw a couple of particles out there, there's scatter light, we're saved. Well, where do the particles go? What do they do? Um, what else are they doing up there? And I'll give you an example. I, I was asked to review a paper. I was on an editorial board, and it was a physicist writing a paper on using uh, titanium dioxide in a geoengineering uh, proposal type of way, putting it up into, he was going to use a bazooka. I didn't know how exactly that was going to work, but <laughs> get it up into the higher upper atmosphere, and everything would be great, and it would scatter light. And he did all his calculations using uh, electromagnetic theory and proved, you know, assuming a sphere of a certain size, it would do this, and it would be great. And I just read that, and I was like, well, I guess he didn't read about the papers, how ozone can be destroyed and undergo um, decomposition on titanium dioxide in the presence of light. So he missed that. So we'll, we'll, instead, we'll form the ozone hole again, because he's shooting titanium dioxide up there. Um, I guess he didn't read about, you know, so, oh, you know, the fact that if you have NO2 in the presence of TiO2 and a little bit of water, you form a molecule called uh, nitrous acid. He didn't read about that paper. Okay, so there was all of this chemistry that was just ignored with this electromagnetic theory, perfect sphere, and we would get a good radiation balance after that. So that's an example of a feedback that I was very personally knew a lot about because we studied that chemistry. Um, but um, those are the kinds of things uh, that I worry about, the feedbacks that we can't guess might, what the next steps might be because we ejected these particles into the atmosphere. Um, so I see that the audience has some questions sort of along the same line. So, um, uh, so one of the questions is just, um, uh, what would be the um, 
what would be a good strategy in your view uh, for, for deploying this science <laughs> for this kind of purpose? I mean, do you think that there's a level of complexity to it that makes it actually sort of infeasible? Or do you think that with enough building in enough kind of dynamics and enough understanding of the complexity that we could actually get to a point where we could do this safely? So I had a long conversation with that Harvard chemist, Frank Koish, um, last summer. And um, if you looked at my slide, what, what you would see is that what his study is all about is very small scale, and he wants to see what happens to those particles. Um, when they are ejected. So he's sort of doing these pre-experiments, if you will, to see if some other problem comes about or some uh, chemistry occurs with these particles. So there is some of that being done. And he also reminded me that these types of experiments are already being done by nature. Whenever you have a volcanic eruption, you have a lot of particulate matter getting out into air, into the air, and that's actually shown to decrease the temperature of the Earth. So those experiments have been done a little bit by nature itself. So if you can somehow make sure whatever you're putting out there can uh, doesn't undergo some changes or some chemistry or something else that you didn't anticipate, and then think about it as this sort of a volcanic eruption type of event, um, I don't know, that, that, that's, that's sort of the, along the lines of some of the things that he was thinking about, and uh, we had a very good conversation about it. So one of the questions here is actually about evolution. Um, brilliant audience, thank you. Um, so it's, the question is, we have evolved together with aerosols, so how are new compounds more dangerous? So just as you were talking about these volcanic eruptions and all the aerosols that come from these kind of natural events, um, are new compounds more dangerous than, say, sand or smoke or you know something that um, we would have co-evolved with? Um, sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that, that that is true. Um, there are some compounds that are uh, robust and very persistent, okay, which means they accumulate over time. So, so there's some of those things that uh, um, are engineered, if you will, into these compounds that make them kind of yucky later on, okay? Not so good later on. Um, but you know, there's some naturally occurring things that are not so good for us. There's arsenic in you know uh, soils, okay? Um, there's some um, uh, asbestos in soils, okay? So those are those are somewhat already there. Um, it's when you concentrate them in and bring them in the built environment and then just get exposed to huge amounts that it becomes uh, more problematic. But they are there, and they are they are even problematic in natural settings. Um, but um, some of the things that we do produce um, can cause uh, more, more harm. And we've known that for many years, 60s, earlier. So we have some quite specific questions here about um, different things that might be harmful. Um, so for example, um, pollution controls in, um, in cars, have they made the aerosol problem worse? Do pollution controls work to mitigate the kinds of health concerns that you have about um, polluting traffic? Yeah, so some po pollution controls do work. Um, that's been shown. Um, the three-way catalyst, um, and I can't remember exactly what year that was put in, but that really helped uh, mitigate some of the ozone levels and some of the NOx, nitrogen oxides le levels. Um, in terms of um, particles, um, from uh, automobile emissions or truck emissions. It's, you know, the diesel produces some particles. We see that. Just follow a bus, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You see the plume. I, I, it's not hidden. Uh, there it is. And so I, I think that there are some more things that we can do to reduce that, that type of, those types of particles. So, you know, and I will say from the last questions, there is a natural level of things. And then uh, why, and why I study mineral dust and sea spray, I want to kind of understand on the natural levels, and then we can then see what happens when we add on uh, through these other types of activities that we have control over. Right. And how easy is it even to regulate? I mean, 
part of what comes across so strongly from your work is um, the sheer complexity, the kind of, you know, the combinatorial complexity of how these things react with one another and the kind of dynamics of these systems. Um, how hard or easy is it to regulate something that has this kind of complexity where it's interactive and the health effects are so complex to, um, to disentangle? Um, so uh, we can't regulate ocean sea spray, right? <laughs> for example, but we can regulate contaminated water, right? We can we can fight towards or work towards, I should say, uh, removing contaminants from water, um, whether it's microplastics or a sewer uh, uh, dumpage, you know, sewer dump. Um, we can work uh, on that. Um, so that's what I would say, you know. And then uh, what I would also say is when you make sea spray from the ocean, okay, it it's, uh, gets into the air, and then it can react with gases in the air. And so some of those gases, again, are at higher levels due to emissions and that sort of thing, uh, sulfur oxides, whatever it is, not so much in this country, but in, 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 in some other countries. Um, and that's what's sort of changing the aerosol. So it's very, it is complicated. And that's one of the problems with um, science and explaining it to policymakers is they want yes or no, up or down. And scientists were always, you know, very careful with our answers and nuance because we know the complexity. And so bridging that, you know, a yes or no answer and understanding the complexity can really help us all. But what I would say is that for me, policies should be based on science. So I don't know if everybody heard me. <laughs> policies should be based on science. So I want policies in place that are based on sound science. Yay to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, how effective are um, indoor air purifiers? So you're starting to work on this indoor air, which is so fascinating, this idea that we, we know so much about the outdoors and that you know this place where we spend 10% of our time and yet nothing nothing about the air that we breathe in a space like this. So our indoor air purifiers, do they work? Should we all get them? Don't believe what you read. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Where's the science? Show me the science. You know, um, some indoor air purifiers make the air worse. So if you have, some of them generate ozone to clean. And then let's say you do a little, you do a little cleaning on top of that, a little pledge. Well, pledge plus ozone gives you particulate matter. We've shown that, others have shown that. And so there's really some things about that uh, you should really uh, think about. Um, and we were talking in the car a little bit. I want everybody to buy a particle counter in their house so they know how many particles they have. <laughs> And in, a, in, in my world, you'd be able to buy it from Walmart. Um, and maybe for $5, wouldn't that be good? And then you can actually measure things in your own house and you can buy that air cleaner and then you can turn it on and you can watch your particle counter and see if it goes way up. And your measurement might not be the most accurate in the world, but you can look at changes, right? And so um, I really think that um, knowing um, and being able to measure things, even individuals, um, is something that we should really strive for. Is there a sort of citizen science kind of vision that you have in that respect? Do you see that, um, you know, ordinary people, um, lay people could have a role in understanding these trends and measuring changes and things like that? Yeah, I, I really do. Um, I get calls from people all the time. Um, so I got a call from someone, they were really worried about um, some industry coming in, the, in their community, being built in their community, and they, they were worried about particulate matter, um, and they were worried about it um, for their, it was actually in a rural area for their farm and uh, for their house. They were worried about the uh, farm, uh, you know, be depositing on the farm, and they were really concerned, and the people who were building the, uh, company, oh, they had town hall meetings, don't you worry, we're gonna put that stack in, it's gonna be so high, it'll never you know, bother you at all. 
okay, but you know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe that's right, but maybe that's wrong. And so what that person needed was a particle counter. And actually somebody in our audience has used particle counters um, that we made at UC San Diego in their uh, high school class here. I was just talking to her. Um, and there you are, okay, I can see you. And um, she was able to measure particles. Um, she didn't have a particular question that I, I'm saying now, but that woman could have used that particle counter um, and because that company was gonna build that no matter what, so she should have measured background, right, start measuring a year before, then that company starts you know, doing something, she can measure her particles go up. Then she can say these particles went up, they'll go, oh, well, you, you know, you're, it's not calibrated, nothing you did is right, you're not a scientist, how could you know? But her neighbor's particle counter went up too, and their other particle counter went up. And now you have a group of people who can say, we have the data to show the particle concentrations have increased. And so I, I feel like knowing things and being able to measure things as citizens gives you power empowers you because now you it's not just what you're thinking it's about what you're measuring it's such a wonderful vision of sort of citizen and lay people empowerment to um to understand these kinds of impacts so i have a few questions um here which are really kind of digging into that study about the um the effect on the on brain health of some of this air pollution um, and so one question, one person asked, um, was it only women who were impacted in this study? Were, were men studied or why, why did it seem to be affecting um, cognitive, why did it seem to be having cognitive impairment just in women? I think they, the study was about women. Oh, so I, I, well, I don't okay. think they did a comparison. I think they just monitored and followed uh, a, a group of women. I don't even know what N is, and that is the size of the study. Um, it was an epidemiology study, and so they controlled for a lot of different factors. It's, it, it's science a little bit out of my league in terms of being able to explain how well that study was done, but it was a study uh, that really uh, took people by surprise, the potential of the results. There was actually even another study that I didn't show you uh, today, but I do know about, where um, they dissected uh, people's brains after they were dead, and they found these particles in the uh, brain tissue that they think uh, these particles cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, they did it for a cohort or a group of, of of uh, brains that they analyzed in Mexico City as well as in Liverpool, so in different parts of the world. Um, and that came out in PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a very prestigious journal. I'm not sure, I'd like to see more studies you know, along those lines. So these are, I, to, what I told you about today was some of the first studies that are starting to maybe suggest this. And I think I saw something, the, um, trying to remember, I think I even saw one more the other day linking um, sort of air pollution particulate matter and what I call brain health, okay? And so this is really a, a, a new frontier in a lot of ways. It's fascinating work. Um, and you said that you were doing work on these 3D models, 3D tissue models. Um, and so what kinds of uh, bodily systems are you studying? Yeah, I think um, we're, we're actually starting with the heart. Um, and so my colleague, Xiao Chen Chen, he's, he's uh, in uh, nanoengineering, so he's one of my colleagues in nanoengineering. And he's figured out a way to make like uh, three-dimensional models of the heart. And it doesn't look like a heart that you would, it, it looks a little different when you would expect, but uh, he gets it to beat. So these cells actually like give a beat. Beat, 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 beat. You can watch it. And what we want, what I want to do, is just ask some simple questions. If you expose this heartbeat to these particles, does it slow it down? Does it increase? What you know? What are some of the uh, effects due to uh, particulate matter? And I, we're just starting to uh, work together to look at that. And the reason why we're doing those kinds of studies is that um, right now there's a few ways to study health effects. Um, one is to use animal models. Another is to use just simple cells, like a two-dimensional uh, cell well. 
And the two-dimensional sell well is not sophisticated enough, if you will. It's not, you know, you can do those studies, but it's, it's what are you learning and how, how really uh, does it inform what you know? A lot of good studies have been done with that, but we're now trying to think about how we can do even better studies. And then you have the animal studies, and people are really trying to think about ways to stop using animal models as the first thing that you do, you kind of want to go there later, not use animals quite as much in your studies, uh, mice, rats, whatever it is. Um, and so this is sort of a nice compromise where we can start to ask and address some questions initially, and then we can do other studies a little bit later on. Um, fascinating. And here's a question about all these things, you know, fabric softeners and um, aerosols to clear, to clean the air and, um, you know, particulate perfumes and all of these things. Um, what do you think are the, the effects of all of these kinds of things that are supposed, you know, they sort of give you the illusion that you're making your indoor environment cleaner, but actually, are they actually making it more polluting, do you think? Don't believe what you read. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because it's it's claims without the science. Yeah. So um, often, and that's sad, right? You know, because you think you read something and somebody's putting it out that that's based on science, but not always. So um, that's what I would say. Yeah. Um, and is there a role for systemic? inflammation in some of these responses. I have a question here about um, pro-inflammatory pro cytokines, is that right? Um, and the effects on the brain and on these other bodily systems, these other organ systems. Yeah, I think um, in that science article, that's what they were suggesting was that these cytokines that are produced could actually um, be getting to the brain, and maybe because of that production, um, it was uh, potentially causing some problems. Right, right. And so kind of along those lines, um, this is a very practical question. Can you make a recommendation about the health of people who live next to a highway or a high traffic road in terms of their air quality? You know, for, for some of us, it's just really obvious that where we live is you know, high pollution, we know that we're exposed to stuff that affects our health. What can we do, just on a practical level, do you think? Um, so one thing that, uh, filters do work. Um, filters, uh, when you put them in your ventilation system, they actually work, but you have to make sure that you're maintaining them properly. And so if you're just putting them in and you're not worrying about them for a decade, um, it's, they're not working for you. And so I think that's one thing that if you talk to you know, these engineers, control engineers, they really talk about making sure you're uh, changing your filters and you're, you're using your ventilation system properly. So that's, that's, that's an important one to remember. Um, we were talking uh, when we were coming here today um, about, uh, I told you that uh, some of the more dangerous things to do in your home, uh, some of them include <laughs> cooking and cleaning. <laughs> you produce a lot of particulate matter. I knew there was something wrong with cooking and cleaning, and that's why I was avoiding so an it. Interesting feminist <laughs> angle on this. <laughs> but actually, um, use your vent and your, you use the hood and, uh, above your, your stove, okay? That really makes a difference. Um, can't say that about cleaning quite as much, but in cooking, that really makes a difference. So use it, turn it on, keep it going. When you're done, then you turn it off. So things like that really do matter. Um, I do look at the world differently these days, especially with respect to indoor air. Um, if I see a candle and somebody trying to light it, I, I'm like, are you trying to kill us? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you get a lot of particulate matter from candles. Sorry, sorry, everybody. Oh. And um, so there's some things that you really might not want to do that uh, you used to do, but there are some things that you can do to, to also help the situation. Um, but I do think that if you live near a highway, you're probably being exposed to more particulate matter. I'm sorry, that's the bad news. Use your filter, make sure you clean it. So we are out of time, um, and I just want to thank the audience for coming and for being such, asking such brilliant questions, and above all, to thank Vicky for such a good talk.